It is NBA trade deadline day across the NBA, and we've got you covered on the Locked On Podcast Network. We have been following, breaking down all of the latest trades that have been going on. It's been a frenzy throughout the day, but we're excited now to talk about the Knicks. I mean, rather than moves, more so lack of moves, I'd say. But let's bring in Locked On Knicks host, Alex Wolf. Alex, thanks so much for being with us. Did you get any sleep last night? Uh, Very little. Yeah, I'm running on a, a few hours. I mean... So the heart trade broke and then I'm like, OK, let me record a quick reaction and I'd start scripting a show and then I recorded the show and then the Kevin Durant news broke. So then I was kind of uh, uh, captured by that for a little bit and then finally managed to go to bed pretty late. But, you know, it's like we all come into this expecting that the trade deadline day is not going to be our best uh, sleep cycle day of the year. So I think I'm holding up pretty good, all things considered. All right, good. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we'll talk a little bit more about the Knicks' lack of moves today, but I want to start with talking about shooting guard Josh Hart, who you mentioned they picked up last night while offloading Cam Reddish. Uh, Break down that trade for us, and what is your general sense of that? I think it's it represents probably like the biggest risk that the Leon Rose front office has taken in the sense that this front office, if you go all the way back to the Phil Jackson era, in like 2014 so oh my god that's almost 10 years now uh they have not i might need to be corrected here but outside of a draft day trade i don't believe that they have traded one of their own first round picks since 2014 um so they broke that trend with this deal and of course it's you know it sort of comes with the caveat of yeah but they have the mavericks pick as well this year so it's not like they're completely exiting themselves from Uh, the first round of this upcoming draft, but they did more or less like, unless things go horribly, not according to plan and they end up missing the playoffs, they most likely traded their first round pick along with Cam Reddish uh, and Svi Mikhailuk and Ryan Archer Diakono for those keeping score uh, for Hart here. And so it's sort of a, it's a move that to me signifies like where their priorities are right now. Uh, For one thing, they, definitely are fully invested in this like playoff push. You know, this is not going to be a situation like we saw like with Utah where they maybe won a little too much earlier in the year. And Danny Angel's like, got to offload these dudes now. Like, you know, cannot win games down the stretch of the season because we want Wembenyama. Definitely not the case for the Knicks. Like they're like, no, we see progress. We like this. We invested in Jalen Brunson. We've invested in Julius Randle, RJ Barrett. Like we want to see this through and we want to like make some progress this year and make the playoffs. Um, It also sort of signified to me that they probably were looking at Hart as a guy that they would be interested in this offseason and saw this as an opportunity to sort of pay that premium to then get the ability to re-sign him while being over the cap this offseason because they will be. Um, They have Brunson, Randall, RJ, all on around $30 million a year deals right now. They have uh, Mitchell Robinson on a $15 million a year deal roughly. They have Evan Fournier still under contract for next year. So there's enough contracts on the books that they're not going to have cap space this coming off season if they would have wanted to add a Josh Hart, but they have enough of an inside track. Like he's a former Leon Rose client. Um, His current agent, I believe he shares with Julius Randle. So like there's all those CAA connections there and the Villanova connection with Jalen Brunson, like one of the most adorable videos of the trade deadline was Jalen Brunson at his Jersey retirement ceremony at Villanova learning that, Josh Hart was going to be his teammate and like freaking out. Um, So, yeah, I think it's it's sort of a win now moving away. It also is a guy who's sort of in his prime in Hart that sort of has been blossoming these like last two years, especially last year, been a little bit down uh, this year. But I think that it's it it basically signifies for one thing that the, the Knicks are bought in on this core and want to continue getting better and also fills a need. I mean, that he you know, Hart will hopefully give them a little extra scoring punch off the bench, gives them good defensive rebounding off the bench, like basketball fit wise. I think he's fantastic as well. So again, little bit of a risk moving a first round pick, which has been something they've been averse to doing, but ultimately one that I think is going to work out pretty well for them because Hart's just clearly a winning basketball player and, and definitely fits the type of player this team likes. 
Okay, interesting. So I know going into this, it did really seem clear that you mentioned that the Knicks are kind of happy with what they've been building, despite they're sitting at seventh right now, 30 and 26 Mm -hmm. on the season, seventh in the East. Um, But, you know, they felt like they didn't need to make any maybe major moves or to, you know, really offload some of their young talent who I want to talk about a little bit. Were you surprised maybe by the lack of moves, despite a lot of conversations surrounding young talent like Obi Toppin and also the veteran former MVP, Derek Rose, were you expecting to see more activity at all today? I expected that there would be a Rose deal. Um, You know, I I think that they sort of were just saying, like, we're going to do right by Derek or whatever, you know, and and they were, I think the plan was to find a new home for Rose. Um, It sounded like there was at the 11th hour, like some buzz about him potentially going to Milwaukee and the numbers just didn't come together. I mean, it is what it is. I'm sure he's been a super, you know, like consummate professional. So I'm sure if they tried, I don't think they'll go as far as like buying him out because they do definitely like his like veteran leadership. And he's very well respected by the young core that you mentioned, like Deuce McBride, Emmanuel quickly, all these guys talk like super highly of Rose and what he's offered to them, especially quickly. Like they're like best buds. Um, So I think the Knicks ultimately and Rose probably too, are ultimately okay with how things wound up going down. Um, As far as like being surprised that they didn't make more moves. I don't think so. I mean, the other thing is like, you know, the fact that they're willing to like buy in doesn't really surprise me too much because if you look at the standings in the East right now, like they're sitting at seventh, but they're a half game behind Miami. They're only like three games behind Brooklyn right now. And we all just saw what happened in Brooklyn. Like there's a very real chance they could move up to the five seed uh, in the next couple of weeks here. If this hard edition really works out for them, especially considering like the Nets got worse like lost a potential MVP candidate and, you know, Kyrie Irving. And then the Heat didn't really do anything. Um, I think I saw something that Pat Riley might have been asleep at the trade deadline or something. Um, <laughs> but regardless of of all that, like I, I didn't expect them to go crazy. There was sort of a scary rumor of like them potentially going after Zach Levine, which I don't know would have been the right move. Uh, there was also they were linked to like OG on and Obi pretty yeah. pretty strongly leading up to this week, but that sort of got debunked as early as like yesterday. Um, a lot of the like local Knicks guys were saying like the asking price is just too high. It's probably not going to happen um, because the Knicks just aren't prepared to give up like four first round picks or whatever for this guy, which I don't blame them. Like I don't think o- OG Ananobi is primed for some like huge superstar breakout. I think he's just, I think he occupies a space slightly higher than the guy that they wound up getting in Josh Hart, as far as like a defensive minded role player that can, do some different things, scoring the ball and play different positions and whatever. So um, yeah, in the end, I I don't think that they like uh, went, you know, opposed to my expectations here. You know, I think that this was about what I thought. I mostly just thought that the Rose thing would happen and they would just kind of like find a new home for him. But outside of that, it was, I think it was pretty much chalk for about what I expected. I, I didn't think there would be too much more going on after the heart trade last night. Interesting. And you brought up the fact that, you know, the Knicks are just maybe three games behind the Nets and they could be in that five spot. Uh, but you look at the top of the Eastern Conference at the Celtics, the Bucks, even the 76ers have been playing well recently. Did this move and adding Hart really make them competitive? Or what do you think the ceiling is? How much of an improvement do you think the Knicks could see after this trade? I mean, I think they'll look better. You know what I mean? It's it's going to take a little bit of integration. But one thing, you know, you won't have to work on any chemistry between the Knicks' primary initiator in, in Brunson and Hart because they played together, won national title together uh, in yeah. college. So they know each other very well. Uh, so that should ease the transition again. I I don't think that this was a move that's made to necessarily, like, build a championship contender right right now. You know what I mean? I think it's yeah. it's a move that helps them get incrementally better, which has been sort of the Knicks' MO these last few years. Obviously, we saw in 2021, they had sort of a freak season that I think adjusted expectations a little too high for them in some ways, like sneaking into that four seed at the end of that season by virtue of a really well-placed nine-game winning streak. Like, even Knicks fans at the time were like, this is kind of fluky. Like, you know, we're excited, obviously, to host a playoff series, but like, this is kind of fluky. And that bore out last year when you saw then that things kind of imploded a bit and Julius Randle wasn't happy and whatever this year. Now they're sort of back to building and improving again. And they've got Brunson now who's played like an all-star maybe will be an injury replacement. Who knows uh, with a bunch of spots opening up, but you know, he certainly played that way. Randall has kind of refound his all-star form. Barrett is still developing. You still have a bunch of guys on the team that are like actively developing while the team is playing well, like a Quentin Grimes and 
Deuce McBride and Emmanuel quickly, even Obi Toppin, who uh, you and I were talking pre-show, like doesn't get enough minutes, but is still yeah. showing improvement in the time that he's out there. So, you know, there, there's this really, and Mitchell Robinson, who I think has become one of the best defensive centers in the NBA and probably the best rebounder in the NBA this year. Um, so, you know, there, I think it's all just about incremental improvement for them. So like this heart move represents that, but they also left the powder dry for the big move down the line. And that's the important thing is like this move didn't, that's what the difference between this and like an OG on move is right. Like if you make that OG on move and you give up like three or four first round picks, all of a sudden right. you're like, Oh man, if this doesn't work, like what are we going to do? Cause we just gave up the package for this guy, Josh Hart, you know, giving up the first round pick, you still have another one this year in the Mavericks pick. You have three protected first round picks going forward uh, from Washington, Detroit, and Milwaukee. And you have all of your other own picks other than this year's going forward as well. So like they still are in a position that's very similar to where they were last summer, as far as going after Donovan Mitchell, where they could give up like four, five first round picks in some Kevin Durant esque deal. Like what the Suns just did. Like we just saw, sort of a new price be established for like an A1 star in Kevin Durant, which was four first round picks, um, one swap and like three good young players. So I, I think that they are in position to go after a player like that in the future if they feel like they're ready to take that like sort of final step towards contention. But right now, I, I think they'd be perfectly, perfectly happy with where they're at and and what's going on. So I'm, uh, I'm good with how things went and, I think we'll just continue seeing incremental improvement going forward from them. So they made the incremental improvement. They're competitive. Do you have any predictions or expectations for what this off season might hold? You mentioned the potential to maybe make an aggressive move and go after a star. Um, do you have any predictions or is there anything you would like to see happen in the off season? Any certain piece you feel like is missing from the team that they could potentially add as we look forward? I think it's too early to say. I think ultimately what's going to end up being the move is you would have um, R.J. Barrett be the centerpiece of a move to get like an A1 star to pair with Brunson and Randall at this point. Who that might be, I don't know. Everything is so fluid in the NBA. Like if you would have asked anybody like a week and a half ago, like, hey, do you think that Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving are both going to be on new teams by – the trade deadline, everybody would have been like, no, like that's way too much movement to happen that quickly. And that's how fast things move in the NBA. So I don't know who that star would be, whether it ends up being like, I don't, I don't even want to speculate. Like, cause there's no, yes, there's throw no names throw around. Name. We love it. <laughs> I, yeah. I mean, there's no way to throw a name out there without like it look without like having any idea of who it is, but whoever that next star is, the Knicks will be in play just like they were for Donovan Mitchell. And if they, if they go for it, I would not be surprised if they hold out because the price is too high. I also wouldn't be surprised. Um, there's not really too much they could do to surprise me at this point. So, but I, I do hope that if that sort of player becomes available this summer, that they would entertain the idea of going for it, especially if they finish this year off as strong as they've been playing their last like 35 games or so, which they've been playing at almost a 50 win pace for about the last 35 games. So if they close this year out that way, I hope that that's the sort of move they're looking to make this coming summer. All right. Well, a lot to look forward to, it sounds like, for Knicks fans. And we'll leave them with that little tease. Leave it to your imagination as to what stars you would like to see maybe sort of possibly come to the Knicks uh, in the offseason as they still have room since they had a quiet trade deadline day to potentially make a big move down the road. All right. Locked on Knicks host Alex Wolf. Thanks so much for being with us. And you've got to stay tuned for more on the NBA trade deadline. Your local Locked on show has everything covered. Make sure you subscribe to Locked on NBA as well for the latest Locked on your team every day.